Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we are going to be looking at an introduction to geologic cross sections. So some of you might have noticed we are looking at a Word document. This is, I'm afraid, because this lab was put together by me. So brace yourselves. Right, what are we actually doing? Well, a geologic cross section is essentially a prediction of what is happening to layers of rock underground. So geologists and geophysicists can do a whole range of things to see what's happening underground. We can shoot seismic surveys, we can you know, drill boreholes, we can do things, you know, we do a whole range of you know, other geophysical techniques. But the problem with all of these geophysical techniques is they are rather expensive. There's a much cheaper way of trying to work out what's happening underground. And that method involves a geologist, a map, some paper, a pencil, some graph paper as well, to be, to be brutally honest, and a protractor. I want you to know what we might as well throw a ruler in there for good measure. So, as you can see, far more cost effective to actually produce a cross section. Okay, so the first thing is, is where are we going to get the data to produce this cross section? Well, I'm sure you remember that when a geologist goes to an outcrop we can start collecting data using our compass so now remember this is a geologic compass not a regular compass so what we can do is we can collect information about layers of rock so if we can find some kind of feature that essentially has a tabular or a flat surface to it we can take measurements of that particular feature so we can measure things like the beds of rock or fault planes or folds we can take all that kind of we can take all that information in and we can measure it now when we measure a layer of rock what do we what do we see well if we look at this picture here this is our situation so this is our layer of rock here and we can see our layer of rock is above the ground surface here so it's exposed and we can get to it now obviously once our layer of rock comes dips below the surface here we've lost it it's gone Okay, we, we can't get to it anymore. So once it's underground, we have to essentially predict what's going to happen to it using the measurements we can take at the surface. So the measurements that we will take at the surface are the dip angle. That's the first one. So the dip angle simply says at what angle is this layer of rock dipping into the earth? Okay. So if we look at this layer of rock here, now we, we measure it from an imaginary horizontal plane. And so we'll take the dip angle, which is obviously the, dip, the angle between the imaginary horizontal plane and the surface we're actually measuring. And in this case, if you look at it, it's probably about 20 degrees, give or take a little bit. So this layer of rock is dipping into the ground at about 20 degrees. So we know the angle at which the layer of rock is going into the ground. What else do we know? Well, we can, we can measure what's called the dip direction. And that says which direction is our layer of rock dipping into the ground. So this is our layer of rock. Is our layer of rock dipping north? Is it dipping east? Is it dipping west? Is it dipping south? Okay, and I hope I've got east and west the right way around. I'm not honestly sure. That's all the dip direction is. It just simply says if the layer of rock is dipping south, or was this east or west? Who knows? Who cares? Let's just call it east. If the layer of rock is dipping east, okay, then as a geologist, we say the layer of rock is dipping 0, 090. 0. If the layer of rock is dipping south, it's dipping 180. If the layer of rock is dipping west, it's dipping 270. Okay? And of course, if it's dipping north, it's dipping 0, 0, 0. So we can get, we've got two pieces of information so far. The dip, the angle at which the rock is going into the ground, and the dip direction, okay? So the direction based on a compass, the north, south, east, and west of a compass, which direction that layer of rock is going into the ground. The final piece of information we can get is something which, was, which is referred to as the strike. And the strike is 90 degrees to the dip direction. So you're thinking to yourself, well, what's the point of the strike? 
Well, the strike tells us what the orientation of the feature is. So if we have a layer of rock, and that layer of rock is you know running north-south, well, the strike of that feature is going to be north-south. Okay, so what we're essentially doing is by adding the strike, we're essentially saying, right, this is the orientation. This is di the direction that this feature was running. It wasn't going east-west, it was going north-south. And so what we do as geologists is we put all this information into this symbol here, which is called a dip and strike symbol. And this is very commonly seen on geologic maps. And when we do exercise 13, which is coming soon, we will essentially see be seeing quite a few of these. So this essentially is a simplified method of telling us the information that we need. So it tells us the dip angle. This shorter portion of the symbol here tells us the dip direction. And this longer part of the symbol here shows us the strike. Okay, so those are essentially the basic, basic piece of information that we need. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this information and we are going to use it to start producing cross sections of what is happening underground. Now to be to be clear, these cross sections we're going to produce are very simple and they're you know not you know, they're uh, they're very simplified, very easy versions. They are not the more complicated situations that we get in the real world. But anyway, let's get going. Let's start with exercise one. Okay, so for exercise one, there's a there's a you know there's a, a whole spiel here, essentially describing the process. Okay, which is continued into these paragraphs here. Now I'm not going to go into them. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on the page that we want. So we're going to zoom in on page three. So oh, flip next. Sorry. Okay, so there we go. There's there's our uh, map. So our map is here, and you can see we have one, two, three, four, five layers of rock. So we've got uh, this layer, this layer, this layer this layer and this layer and you can see we have three layers of rock for which we have data this layer this layer and this layer now it's very common in geology for layers of rock to not have data associated with them this typically means that the geologist could not get to the layer of rock or they could not find a surface which was good enough to take a measurement on and remember these rocks are exposed on the surface of the earth Sometimes it can be difficult to find a flat surface to take an accurate measurement. So sometimes you just have to admit defeat. So what does this map actually tell us? Well, it tells us that this layer, this layer, and this layer are dipping into the earth at 25 degrees. And the layers of rock are dipping into the earth in an approximately northeasterly direction. The strike of the layers of rock, as we can see, is running northwest, southeast, 90 degrees to the dip direction, which was northeast. So what are we going to do about these two layers here? Well, it's actually quite straightforward. If this layer is dipping at 25 degrees northeast and this layer is dipping at 25 degrees northeast, then these two layers must also be dipping at 25 degrees northeast. There's pretty much no way around it. Okay, because it, there are, you know, this, these rocks are essentially going to deform as a package. And so these rocks will also follow the same trends displayed by this layer, this layer, and this layer. Okay, so that's relatively straightforward, isn't it? So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and draw our first cross section. So as you can see, here we have a line going from A to A prime. It's this dotted line here. And this is going to be our line of section. This is the line on the surface of the Earth for which, along which we are going to produce our cross section. So what we are worried about is when things cross our line of section. So for instance, this is the bedding plane, the contact between this layer and this layer. So here's our bedding plane. We are interested where the bedding plane crosses the line of section, right there. We're not interested in the bedding plane up here. We are not interested in the bedding plane down here. We are interested in the bedding plane when it crosses our line of section. Okay. So that means we need to make a mark on our topographic uh, section here saying, right, this is where the bedding plane is located. So it would be located here and here, here and here. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to 
copy this image. So I'm going to do Control C. So I've copied it, and I am going to put it into PowerPoint. OK, so here's PowerPoint. Now, the reason that I'm putting it into PowerPoint is because if I try to draw, and I'm going to have to draw in Word, I will learn very, very quickly that Word is a tremendously clunky program when it comes to drawing. It's not very nice at all. So I'm going to keep my life simple, and I'm going to draw in a program that's a little bit more you know, straightforward to use, I'm going to go for PowerPoint. Obviously, you know, those of you that have more advanced computer skills would go for programs like Corel, for instance. Okay. But anyway, for the, for ease of for ease of you know work, I'm going to go into PowerPoint. Okay. So here's my diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to obviously go to Insert. I'm going to go to Shapes, and I'm going to select Line. And I'm just going to draw a vertical line like so. And just to make it a bit more visible. I'm going to uh, make that line red. OK, so that, oh, there's my red line. OK, and I'm going to start my red line here. Now, I should point out, if you notice, look how the red line is moving. Can you see it's jumping an even amount each time? OK, now that's because the line is snapping to a grid. OK, that means behind this image or, you know, on the screen here, there is an invisible grid. And as we move the line, it is snapping to that grid. It's following it. So that means, obviously, the movement is quite jerky, isn't it? That means we don't get fine movement as we move stuff around. So to allow us to not snap to the grid so we can get fine movement, we are going to hold down the Alt key, AL, the ALT key. So if we press that down, all of a sudden, you can see as we move the line around, we're no longer snapping to the grid. The movement is now a lot smoother, isn't it? We can put the line wherever we want. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the end of the line right here. So it meets the point where our bedding plane crosses our line of section. And I'm going to continue this line down until it hits our diagram. Then I'm going to obviously adjust the line so it's the right length. And then I'm going to do this again. Okay, so once again, I'm going to hold down Alt so that it moves smoothly. There we go. I'm going to adjust the length of it so it meets there. Then I'm going to do it again here. I'm holding down Alt so it moves smoothly. Just extend it to reach. Oh, this is going a bit wrong. Let's just do that there. Good. And then I'm going to just do it one more time because we have this bedding plane right here. Once again, I'm holding down Alt. Okay. And then I'm just going to adjust this so it's the right left. OK, so these four red lines are showing me where the bedding planes cross my line of section. And I'm extrapolating these points onto my topographic section here, which represents the surface, the topography of the surface of the Earth. OK, so what do I know now? Well, I know that this layer here okay, is dipping at 25 degrees. So I know this bedding plane, which represents the top of this layer, must also be dipping at 25 degrees, mustn't it? So okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to go once again to Insert, Shapes, Line, and I'm going to draw myself a horizontal line. Okay, there's my horizontal line. And I'm going to once again choose a color for myself. I'm just going to keep it clean. I'm just going to go with black. OK, so this line here is going to represent the bedding plane. Now, we know the bedding plane is 25 degrees. So how do I make this line go to 25 degrees? Well, it's actually quite simple. I'm going to select the line. You'll notice up here I have a format option. So I'm going to click format. And here I have a for, uh, an option called rotate. So I'm going to select rotate. Then I'm going to go to more rotation options. And then it's going to give me a range of options, but one of them is going to be rotation. And I'm going to put in 25 degrees, 25. I'm going to hit return. And there we go. It's instantly changed, rotated my line to 25 degrees. OK. Now, please note, in order to do this easily, draw a horizontal line, not a vertical line. OK. So then what am I going to do? I'm going to take my line. Now, once again, you'll see this, it's got this jerky movement because it's snapping to that grid. Okay, 
as soon as I'm getting close, I'm going to press down the Alt key. So jerky, jerky movement, and then all of a sudden smooth because I pressed down the Alt key. Okay, so now I'm just going to put this here so it so it matches. There we go. Okay, so now you can see this line here is matching with where the red line meets the topography. Now you'll notice this line does not go all the way. So if I just try and extend this line, as you can see, it's going to wiggle around all over the place, isn't it? Okay, so it's going to be quite difficult to extend it accurately. So how am I going to extend it accurately? Well, in order to do that, I need to select the line. I'm going to prepare to extend it. But before I do that, I'm going to press down the shift key. So I'm holding down the shift key right now. And now I'm going to extend the line and you can see it's extending it smoothly and it's not wiggling around. I can try and move the mouse pointer all over the place, but the line is only extending forwards and backwards. That's it. So there we go. I'm going to extend it till it hits the bottom and then I'm going to finish up there. Okay. So now I know we know these two layers of rock must be dipping at 25 degrees. So I know this bedding plane here must also be at 25 degrees. So I'm just, to make my life simple, I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to copy and paste this line here. I'm going to move it to this point here. And then once again, I'm going to hold down shift and then I'm going to make it the right length. I'm going to repeat the process, just to copy and paste because I'm lazy. Okay, there we go. Hold down shift, make it the right length. And finally, copy and paste. Hold down Alt so I can move it cleanly. There we go. Hold down Shift and make it the right length. Oh, now that did not go to plan, did it? Let's try that one again, shall we? There we go. And that's it. I've now drawn a cross section of what's happening underground. So essentially, I've drawn these five layers of rock all dipping into the earth at 25 degrees so I know what's happening in the subsurface don't I so once and so now all of a sudden you begin to see the the power of cross sections now I would say one of the things you can do is you can note the names of each of the layers of rock on the diagram if there's space that just helps okay so what are we going to do next so what we're going to do next is we're going to select all the stuff on the diagram and we're going to group it Okay, so now it's all grouped, it's all locked together. So now we're going to select all this stuff and we're going to copy it. So I'm going to do Control C and I'm going to go back to our diagram here. I'm going to now select this diagram here. I'm going to delete it, get rid of it. And now I'm going to paste the diagram from PowerPoint. There it is, just Control V. And there we go. We've dumped in the diagram from PowerPoint. And you can see we've got this, these lovely 25 degree lines there. Great. Now, just to make things a bit cleaner, I'm going to cheat slightly. I'm going to do paste special. I'm going to drop it as a drop it in as a PNG file. And you can see things look a little bit cleaner there. Not quite as fuzzy as the previous image, but that's personal preference. Okay. So that was example number one. Well, exercise one, shall I say. Okay. Exercise number two is also quite straightforward. Once again, there is a paragraph here explaining what's going on. So sometimes in geology, we have a situation where the bedding is horizontal. And this circle here with a cross net means horizontal bedding. That means the bed has no dip. It's perfectly horizontal. So we can see on this map here, we have rock MK. So the question is, is well, what's happening underneath MK? Well, Attached to every map, there is something called a stratigraphic column, which puts the layers of rock on that map in the correct order, from oldest at the bottom to youngest at the top. So if we look at this diagram here, here's our little stratigraphic column for this map. We can see we have MK, which is the layer here, and beneath MK is DJ, and beneath DJ is VB. So we know below MK there are two layers of rock. Now, you can, if you have the correct, you know, if you have a good quality map and the correct tools, you can calculate how thick how thick DJ and VB should be under MK in this map, okay? 
but we we don't have those you know we don't have uh, the the correct techniques and let's face it we've got other things to do with our lives so what we're going to do is we're just going to guess we're going to be lazy so what are we going to do well once again we are going to select our diagram we're going to control c and we're going to go to powerpoint as you can see i actually have a few things open so here we go this is going to be our new slide i'm just going to delete this stuff on the background because i don't want it and I'm going to paste the image from the lab. Okay, insert, shapes, horizontal line. And I know the bedding is going to be horizontal because if MK is horizontal, then that means DJ is probably going to be horizontal. And if DJ is probably horizontal, then VB is probably horizontal. So essentially I'm gonna end up with a situation like this. Copy and paste, because I'm lazy once again. There we go. And obviously then I, just to make life simple, or to make life a bit cleaner, I'll just make the lines black. And there we go, done. MK, DJ, VB. And so we can see that in the subsurface, our layers of rock are horizontal. Okay, now this is, a, you know, quite a bit of an assumption, you know, DJ and VB could do other things underground. But what I'm doing is I'm extrapolating based on the fact that MK is horizontal. So in this in this instance, I'm assuming that DJ and VB will follow the same dip. Okay, so once again, group all this stuff together. Then copy. Then we're going to return to our Word document. And then we are going to delete the map that's there. And then we're going to paste our map from our PowerPoint slide. Okay, once again, though, just because it's force of habit, I'm actually going to paste the image as a PNG file. And just it's just that little bit sharper, in my opinion. Okay, so what's next? So here we go. So this is what's next. So this one's a little bit more complicated. So once again, we are going to go copy, control C. I'm going to take this image and we're going to drop it into PowerPoint. So it's going to delete that stuff because we don't want it. And we're going to drop it in. OK, so here's our diagram. So in this instance, we can see we have seven layers of rock. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now we can see this layer, this layer and this layer are dipping into the ground at 45 degrees. And we can see from the dip direction that they are the dip direction essentially is east. So what we have is we have three layers of rock which are dipping east. On the other side, we have another three layers of rock that we're dipping at 45 degrees and they're dipping 45 degrees to the west. So those three layers are dipping this way. So we have three layers dipping this way and three layers dipping this way. Okay. Now, the other thing that you will notice is we have repeating layers. We have JB on this side, and there's JB on this side. We have WD on this side, WD here. We have YM here, and YM here. So what we have is we have the same layers of rock repeating again. This is a classic sign of a fold. Okay, so, sorry, just gotta sit up a bit. A bit. So when we see layers of rock repeating themselves and running parallel to each other, this is a classic indication that our you know, sedimentary sequence has been folded. Now, if you remember, there are two main types of fold, anticline and syncline. An anticline looks like an arch. A syncline looks like a trough. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to plot up this data and we're going to see what we end up with. Okay, so once again, what we're going to do is we're going to have to draw where features cross our line of section which is here so in this case the only features crossing our line of sections are the bedding plates so once again i'm going to draw myself a vertical line which i'm going to color red just so i can see it a little bit more easily and then i'm going to hold down alt so i can move it cleanly and i'm going to move it so that didn't work very well and there we go okay and so I'm just going to, once again, I'm, I'm lazy. I'm going to do it to random ones just because, you know, why not? And 
Nope, did not want to do that. There we go. So you can see I'm just using the red lines here to mark the positions where the bedding planes are crossing my line of section. Okay, see so these are the locations on my topographic di uh, di uh, diagram here where the bedding planes are crossing my lines of section. Okay, so we can see that these three layers of rock are all dipping at 45 degrees. So I know this bedding plane is going to be 45 degrees, this bedding plane is going to be 45 degrees, and this bedding plane is going to be 45 degrees. So line, horizontal, okay, always remember horizontal so I'm going to make this line black again and in order to take it to 45 degrees I am going to select the line go to format go to rotate more rotation options and then here's the rotation and I'm going to put in 45 hit return and now my line is dipping at 45 degrees okay so here we go I'm going to hold down the alt key get it in the right position Hold, oh, that wasn't the right position. Let's try again. Hold down the Alt key, get it in the right position. There we go. Then hold down the Shift key and extend it until it reaches full length. Okay. Then I'm going to, once again, be lazy. I'm just going to copy the line again. Hold down Alt. Okay. Hold down Shift to make it the right length. I'm going to hold down Alt again. Okay, and there we go. So now I have my three lines. Now I'm going to do the same thing for this on this side. So once again, I'm going to go to Insert, Shapes, Line, and I'm going to draw my line here. Now because I wanted to dip 45 degrees the other way, I've got to go in the opposite direction. So if I want them to dip this way, I go 45 degrees this way. If I want to go this way, I've got to do 360 degrees minus 45. Okay. So it's going to be, of course, 315. So once again, selected my line, format, rotate, more rotation options. Now I'm going to put in 315 because that's 360 minus 45. I'm going to hit close. There we go. And there it is. So that's the opposite. So now I'm going to move this into position. Okay. So obviously I know these three layers of rock are dipping these three layers of rock are dipping at 45 degrees to the west, which is over here. So I know this bedding plane's 45, this bedding plane's 45, and this bedding plane's 45. So I'm going to extend this to there. Now you might have noticed I haven't made these lines black. I'm just doing it just so I can show you the difference of what's going on. Okay. So here we go. So all of a sudden, you might be able to spot something. Well, in this instance, we would have layers of rock which are essentially plowing into each other. Okay? Now, you can't really do that. So what's obviously happened is, is our layers of rock have been folded. And so what's happening is, in this case, JB is going to come down, fold, well, it's going to come down, then it's going to hinge, and then it's going to come back up on the other side, isn't it? So how are we going to finish off this diagram and actually make it look good? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to select our lines again. We're going to hold down that shift key and we're going to extend the lines until we get to the point where they meet. We're going to do the same thing for this line here. We're going to extend it up to the point where they meet right there. Okay, we're going to do the same for this line and this line. Now these two lines, this one here and this one here, they clearly meet down here below the bottom of the diagram, so we are not going to worry about those. Now you can see I haven't finished this properly, but you know, you guys would obviously make the lines meet nicely. I, on the other hand, am being lazy, so I'm just going to skip that process. So then I'm going to select everything, group it, control C, going to head back to our diagram here. I'm going to delete this and I'm going to paste in what we just did on PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. So you can see now I have drawn myself 
a diagram here, which is showing that layer JB is dipping down and then it's coming back up. Okay, so remember we have two features, anticlines and synclines. Anticlines form arches, synclines form troughs. Okay, so it asks you what structure is this, anticline or syncline, so you're going to have to work it out for yourself. Okay, so next, the next part of the same exercise, sorry, we have uh, this, a similar situation where we have three layers of rock on each side. Okay, we have the same layers of rock repeating on each side. That's a classic indicator of a fold. But I'm not going to do this. I'm going to leave this one completely to you guys. So I'm going to skip this. So what about exercise four? Oh, it's going to ask you what structure is that as well. Don't forget that question. So exercise four. Well, in exercise four, we have a situation where we run into an igneous rock, a granite in this case, GR. So one of the problems we have with igneous rocks is underground, they can do pretty much whatever they want. So we can't be certain how the boundary of something like a granite acts. It could go straight down. It could go all over the place. It could cut back on itself. We don't know. So what do we do? Well, we essentially fudge it. I know, I know it's not a particularly great thing to say, but you know, that's pretty much what we do. Unless we have you know, it, you know, solid evidence to, so we know what's happening, we just have to, in some cases, just make it up. And you know, we're going to fudge it in this instance as well. So we're going to open our slide. We're going to get rid of this stuff because we don't want it. So delete that. And we're going to paste our image. There it is. OK. So what are we going to do? Well, we are going to draw our vertical lines. Now, in this case, I'm just going to do one. So I'm going to draw the vertical line that's going to link my granite, or should I say where the boundary of my granite meets this layer of rock here. So that my boundary is crossing my line of section right there. So there we go. I'm going to move this into position right there. there just make my line red. Okay. And obviously I'm going to extend it all the way down until it meets the surface. There we go. Okay. Now, obviously, you would do the same for all these bedding planes here, and you can do that. You know, that's relatively easy. Do you know what? I am actually just going to do it for just this one layer right here. Okay. So I'm just going to drop that right there. Okay. Oh, see that? He didn't mean to do that. Oh, I'm just making things worse now, aren't I? Let's try that one again. I don't know why I'm saying oopsie daisy. That's a term I have not said for years. I don't know why I'm saying it now. Nerves, one would assume. Okay, so this is our boundary. So what's our boundary going to do underground? If we don't have any evidence, essentially it could just do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in a reasonable boundary. We're not going to do anything stupid. I'm just going to draw a boundary which undulates, okay, but is coming down pretty much vertically. Okay, so I'm just going to go to shapes. Now, in this instance, you could use something like the freeform tool, but I personally like the uh, the curve tool. So we're just going to come down and we're just going to keep clicking. And we're going to draw our boundary. And double click at the end. And there we go. That's our line. Now, obviously, we are then going to make this line black so we're going to go to shape outline and make it black and there is our boundary okay as you can see it has some topography but we've made it straight now what about this layer of rock here well we know we've got a layer of rock at 45 degrees a layer of rock at 45 degrees and we know these layers of rock are dipping towards the eastern side of our diagram aren't they we can see the dip direction here okay so they're dipping off towards the eastern side so that means they're going to be dipping down like so towards the east so once again we're going to get our horizontal line here okay we're going to go to we're going to sorry, we're going to make it black we're going to go to format rotate more rotation options and 45 degrees hit return and there we go there's our boundary rock well there's our boundary should i say I'm going to move it into position okay now the most important thing is this this layer of rock is going to terminate when it hits the granite because remember the granite has come in later and it has cross cut 
this layer of rock here. So essentially, this layer of rock here past this point has been obliterated. It's, it's gone now. It's not there anymore. So that means this layer has to terminate, has to stop when it meets the margin of the granite here. And the same with any other layers which hit the, the margin of the granite. They must also stop as well. Okay, so once again, you can do the rest of this diagram yourself. It's relatively straightforward. I'm not going to tell you any more. Okay, so I'm going to set up for the next diagram. Get rid of that stuff. And we're going to go back to our no, diagram here. Okay, so we're going to come on down. Now, here is quite a realistic situation. In fact, it's so realistic that I've actually put the answer up. Good work, me. Yay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete that diagram there. Okay. <sighs> Let's face it. You just pause the image. So why am I doing that? I might as well just show it to you. It's too late now. Who cares? So what we have here is a situation where we have two dikes. So we have our sequence of rocks. We can see them here. Okay. So we have LS, JU, JD. Now here's JD on the other side. So this is all one layer. We have BT, RF, EC, and here's EC as well. So this is all one layer as well. Okay. And we can see that all of these layers are dipping at 25 degrees to the east. So they're dipping over here. We can see that because the dip direction symbol on our dip and strike symbols tells us that. Okay. So we know all of our layers are going to be dipping at 25 degrees this way. And you can see I've drawn them beautifully, dipping at 25 degrees there. Wonderful. Now, we can also we also have these two features here, dy and what well, I think is di. And you can see these are essentially features that have a relatively strong width. Strong is the wrong word. What am I saying strong? Consistent. That's the word I'm looking for. A relatively consistent width. Okay. Now this is a classic indicator of a dike. Dikes, for some strange reason, tend to maintain a relatively e even width along very, very large portions of themselves. So this is a dike. It's a straight feature and it can, you know, it has a relatively consistent width. So you know, that's a good suggestion. It may well be a dike. The other thing is, is that you can quite clearly see this rock is just right in the middle of, of uh, JD. Same with this layer here. DI here goes through both EC and RF. So it's just cutting through them. Now that's a strong indicator. Of course, we have a cross cutting relationship situation. So we know that DI must be younger than EC and RF. We know that straight away. So once again, what we're going to do is we're going to draw the boundary. So where the boundaries of these two dikes cut across our line of section, we're going to extend the lines down okay, to where they meet our topographic section. Then we're going to draw them at 70 degrees for this one and 80 degrees for this one. In the case of the dike DI here, you can see that they're dipping down at 70 degrees to the west. So over here, in the case of dy you can see they're dipping at 80 degrees to the east you can see the dip direction symbol there so they're going to be dipping this way okay so that was relatively straightforward but i am going to replace it with the proper diagram in the lab so i'm afraid you are going to have to draw it yourselves so what about exercise five well exercise five is the final exercise and it's to do with faults so you can see we have a sequence of rocks here Okay. Now on this side, the rocks are dipping 45 degrees, 40 degrees, sorry, to the west. Over here, they're dipping 20 degrees to, sorry, these are dipping 40 degrees to the east. These are dipping 20 degrees to the west. Now with the exception of this layer over here. So just bear that in mind. So this layer is dipping 10 degrees to the east. So over here. All right. So. What's splitting them is this feature that's running right down the middle right here. I should point out on maps, faults are normally drawn as quite thick uh, black lines. I, for some strange reason, just drew it as a thin line that looks like the rest of them. So that's my fault. Um, but this line here is a fault. Now, one of the things that faults will often have is they will often have an arrow like this. And the arrow will essentially point in the dip direction of the fault. 
and it will give you the dip angle of the fault. So we know this fault is dipping 80 degrees to the east. So okay, so once again we are going to take our diagram, we're going to drop it into PowerPoint and we're going to start drawing our map. So our map, sorry, our cross section. So insert shapes. So we're going to start off by doing our vertical lines. A bit excessive there. I'm going to make that line red so we can follow what we're doing with it. Okay, and I'm just going to draw a few lines. I'm going to put this one in here. Copy and paste. I'm going to put this one in here. And I'm just going to copy and paste. Okay, now then I'm just going to do this line here. And I'm also then going to do this line over here. Okay, so obviously I'm then going to trim these to the correct length. So I'm just going to hold down the Alt key and make them the correct length. Okay, that good. There we go. Okay, so now this this uh, fault here is 80 degrees to the west. So once again, I'm just going to put in a horizontal line. Then I'm going to go format, rotate. And I'm going to just say 80 degrees. Now that didn't work because what I did is I put 80 divided by zero, which isn't going to happen. So there we are, 80 degrees. And so this is going to be my fault here. There we go. Hold down shift, of course. And I'll just extend it to the bottom of the diagram there. Now in this case, what I am going to do is I'm going to make the line black, but I am going to increase the weight of it there we go, so now it looks slightly heavier than the rest of the lights. So that's my fault there. So now I'm going to draw these other beds of rock. So here, we're going to, here we go, I'm going to draw this IG HV boundary, which is going to be at 40 degrees. Okay, so here I go again. Line, horizontal, format, rotate, more rotation options. And then I'm going to put in 40 degrees. And there we go. So that's my that's my boundary. Hold down Alt, remember, move it into position, and there we go. No. Your boundary is going to terminate when it hits the fault. The fault essentially is going to be a wall, which your boundary can which your boundary cannot go past. So I'm going to hold down Shift, and then I'm going to move my boundary back until it terminates there at the fault. Okay. So what about this P layer PJ? So it's got a dip of 20 degrees to the west. All right, let's do the thing, same thing again. So horizontal line. Okay. Format. Rotate. More rotation options. Now remember, because I'm dipping in the opposite direction, I need to subtract 20 from 360. So it's going to be 340. So that's my dip of PJ here. So I'm going to move this into position. And obviously then, of course, I'm going to extend it to the correct length whilst holding down shift. Okay. So you can see, if you zoom in, that's pretty darn close to the surface, isn't it? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to zoom in just so I can try and make this look a little better. I'm going to try and make it extend... Now I'm just going to have to use Alt for this. I'm going to have to eyeball it. Okay. So there we go. Now I've kind of cheated a little bit. I've kind of increased the dip just a smidgen so it's a bit more visible. But you can see there is the layer PJ. Now finally I have HV over here. Now I know this layer is dipping at 10 degrees. Okay. So I know somewhere along here there's clearly a situation where I have this layer dipping westwards. This layer, HV, tipping eastward, so I know there's a fold here. It's got to be. So I know somewhere along here I'm going to have the axis of the fold. So I'm just going to cheat, and I'm just going to say, right, this boundary here, I'm going to say it's dipping 10 degrees to the east. And so once again, here's my line. Format, rotate, rotation options, and I'm going for 10 degrees. I'm going to hit return. And there's my layer. I'm going to put it 
into position. Good. Hold down shift, trim to length. And then obviously I'm going to make my line black. Okay. And then you can do the rest yourselves. It's not that difficult. So drawing cross sections is not a difficult process. You just have to pick your line of section and then you're, what you have to do is you have to mark on your line of section when something crosses it. It could be a fault, it could be a bedding plane, it could be a fault. Okay, you have to mark that information onto your cross section. Now, or should I say on your line of section. Now typically when we do this, we would do it using a good old fashioned piece of paper because the map we would have would be physical. So we would take our piece of paper, we would lay it on our line of section and we would use a pencil to make a mark every time a bedding plane crossed our line of section. Now obviously most of you guys are using uh, the digital version of, of this book so what we're going to do is we are going to have to you know use different techniques when we are using you know lab when we're doing exercises like 13 later on because obviously that's a little bit more complicated because we are using a real life map okay so I hope you guys feel like you can handle what's going on and I hope you kind of have a very basic understanding of why geologists you know produce cross sections and it's actually quite good fun once you know what you're doing because you can predict what's happening underground and it's you know interesting to know that kind of information but it's also quite powerful it gives you information that you didn't have so for instance if you're in mining and you're tracking a coal seam for instance well it's good to know if your coal seam is going to you know go down underground and then dip down deeper and deeper and deeper or whether your coal seam is going to come down into the ground and then bend back upwards and outcrop somewhere else so you can you know, build the mine over here so it's always good to know that kind of information okay everyone so remember just follow the basic rules I would strongly advise if you have PowerPoint on your laptop or if you have PowerPoint on your computer I would advise using it okay I just find it a very straightforward tool just to do drawing on it's just easy like I say I'm lazy and oh did anybody spot what I just did wrong with this final diagram? Did you see it? Yep. I drew my boundary from this point down here, which is incorrect. I should have drawn my boundary from this point here, where the boundary crosses the line. The same goes for this one right here. So that is very, very sloppy my uh the gentleman that taught me structural geology when i was an undergraduate would be extremely extremely disappointed in me right now so let's try and rectify the situation there we go let's make this the right length okay good and that's a more representative diagram of what's going on so we're just going to adjust this try and get it in the right position there okay good and that's more realistic so remember we can all make mistakes but just keep an eye out because if you can spot them you can fix them okay double check everything all right now remember i am going to replace that diagram with the black with the blank one so you are going to have to do that diagram that has the uh, two dikes on it so sorry guys all right everybody take care and that's it